Who's Afraid and Why? Um, my name is Renee Friedman. I'm a Global Head of Research at Exante, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by independent global uh, market strategist and former chief currency strategist at City, Ibrahim Rahbari, and Louis Vincent Gav, CEO of GavCal Research. I may add, this is a very global webinar with a very, so we'll be giving a very uh, interesting perspective because I'm in London, Ibrahim is in New York, and Louis Vincent is in China, calling in from Beijing. Um, so hopefully, if we do have some uh, connectivity issues, blame the Great Wall. Okay, let's kick off um, on what is going to be, I think, a fascinating discussion. The first thing I really want to discuss is the fact that uh, in, if we're five days out, I think, from the U.S. election, um, and right now, polls are running pretty much neck and neck. And therefore, I want to kind of ask this question of, why this is happening, what, we're, what the polls actually mean in terms of the prediction markets, which are very much focused on a, tr a Trump win versus the opinion polls. Are the polls getting it wrong? Are markets getting it wrong? Um, and what do we think that this is having in terms of the effect on market pricing, on equities, on bonds at the moment? So I'm gonna throw that question out there, whoever would like to go first. Uh, Abraham, okay. <laughs> so, I was, uh, we, so first of all, good morning. Good morning. I'm very glad to join from New York where I successfully avoided joining any of the rallies or watch baseball over the last few days. And as you said, it's getting to be really exciting over the, over the next uh, few. And uh, let, me, let me say three things about uh, the predicted election outcome and, and, and the market implications. And, uh, and the first is, I, I agree with the prediction markets, which isn't the same as saying that uh, I think that they're a good polling summary or, or that they're a great source of information, but it's really just that my own uh, analysis aligns with that of the prediction markets. And that's really because of the context of the election, very well illustrated by, by the Gallup survey that asks people, which party do you identify with? How do you think about the direction of the country or the economy? Uh, but also, uh, what are the main issues that voters care about? In, all three questions, which historically have been really, really predictive for the outcome of the election, uh, are suggesting that this is the Republicans' turn and it is also time for a change in government. Um, uh, so this is a really useful source of information for me. Secondarily, what we see is even though the polls nationally are close on average, the swing state ones are a lot less close than they were the last couple of times. So if you have a similar type of uh, polling error, which, you know, is, is probably not exactly the right way to think about it. But nevertheless, uh, those swing state polls actually skew a lot more towards the Republican side than they uh, did before as well. And similarly, the information that we're getting from early voting too looks a lot better than, than uh, it did in, in, in 2020 and in, in, in 2016. So the first point is I agree with the prediction markets, but that's not where we uh, take my, my main cue uh, from. The second part is, is there still a path to victory? Uh, there is, and uh, for the Democrats, and that is because uh, young people or voters, uh, young people or women may turn out uh, in very large shares. So I think that's the area to watch. Turnout on the day can depend on many things, including the weather, but there's clearly a major turnout effort uh, going on. But it, it'll really be to, down to these two uh, demographics. But even there, they're not doing, the Democrats are doing okay, but they're doing less well of anything than in 2020. So it doesn't change the outcome, but we certainly need to be prepared for surprises, which we've seen. And then a quick comment on, uh, on, on, on markets, which have clearly been uh, pricing in increasing odds of a Trump victory. And I think that makes sense. So I don't disagree with the market pricing in the macro or in the micro. But what I want, what I want to highlight uh, about the pricing that is really unusual this time around is that historically, markets were pricing a risk premium in inequities going into big events, including uh, elections. And that's really important because you tend to want to buy the asset that is having a big risk premium. This time around, the risk premium is in bonds. So bond deals have been going up, bond prices have been going down in the US for a variety of factors, but clearly the increasing odds of the Trump victory are playing into that as well. And that's why I think it is really interesting to, or, or the reason why I think that's really interesting is, again, historically, it makes sense to buy the asset that is selling off into an election so against the, the common grain and against my medium-term view, 
I actually think there are a good number of scenarios where bond yields could actually slightly drop after the election, not quite irrespective of the election outcome, but under quite a few scenarios. Louis Vincent, any, any response to that? No, look, I, I, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. I want to apologize uh, if my internet connection is somewhat unstable. Uh, I'm in Beijing and, you know, sometimes the, the Great Wall of China can, uh, can prove somewhat daunting. So apologies for that. Um, I agree, you know, with everything that uh, Ibrahim said. I think at, at this point, indeed, the, the market has started to price in uh, a Trump win, which uh, for all the reason Ibrahim just highlighted uh, is, is where the odds should be. Um, now, uh, having said that, you know, is, is the market uh, pricing it right? Um, you know, what have we seen in the past few weeks? We've seen uh, gold go up a lot. Uh, to me, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, you know, in, in a world in which uh, Trump is president, uh, I think he's been pretty vocal about his desire to drive the U.S. dollar down. Uh, so, you know, gold could be a, an easy reflection of that. He's also been uh, quite vocal about his desires to, uh, to you know, beat up, cer beat up certain countries with tariffs, uh, turn the U.S. more protectionist. Uh, so, you know, if you're in China, why not move more of your reserves into gold? If you're in India, if you're uh, any, any one of many countries. So all, the, all that makes sense. Uh, does it make sense that uh, U.S. Treasury should sell off? Well, yeah, I think that also makes sense. Uh, hardly, hardly a day goes by without Trump promising new tax cuts uh, and more government spending. So, yeah, that, that also makes sense. Um, perhaps to me, the part uh, that, you know, what you have seen as well in markets uh, is a, uh, on the back of hopes of a Trump win is a big broadening of the performance in the equity markets. Um, it's no longer uh, equity markets that are driven just by uh, your max seven stocks, but you've started to see an outperformance of financials and outperformance of cyclicals, um, which again, you know, in an environment where Trump deregulates uh, and, you know, goes, goes on a, a big fiscal easing, uh, all of that probably makes sense. Um, the part to me, that leaves me a little bit scratching my head is probably the value of the U.S. dollar. Um, you know, I, here Trump has been very, very vocal on his desire to weaken uh, the U.S. dollar. He's been very vocal on his desire to get the Japanese to revalue the massively undervalued yen, to get the Chinese to revalue the massively undervalued renminbi, uh, uh, and even to beat up the Europeans to, uh, to revalue the euro. And, you know, in recent days, you've seen, uh, or in recent weeks, you've seen a U.S. dollar that has firmed up. Um, and that, to me, is, is the part that, that perhaps uh, uh, leaves me somewhat pensive. Because, uh, again, I tend to think that uh, a, a Trump presidency should conceptually be uh, weak for the U.S. dollar. It was last time around, at the very least, uh, that when Trump left uh, office, uh, the, the U.S. dollar was weaker than when it came in. So... I don't know. That's that's the part that leaves me a little bit uh, uh, scratching my head. Okay, interesting points on that. Now, the one thing I would say add to that is obviously the U.S. economy is performing extremely well. We've had GDP numbers coming through yesterday, came in at two point eight percent, slightly down from the three percent previous quarter. We've got. I said equity markets have been reaching highs this year, but there are growing concerns about the overvaluation in stocks. Um, they are looking quite stretched. Um, yes, we have seen some broadening out into the market, but perhaps not enough. Uh, I guess the other big thing that really comes to mind, and, and this kind of goes to the point that you hinted to, Ibrahim, is, and this will also impact the dollar in terms of that medium term outlook. Because obviously, you know, we already know historically when there's an election, generally equity markets are relatively stable six months after, right? However, we're in a business cycle period of change, pretty much. We're looking at a Fed that was cutting rates, and there may be less pressure on it to cut now. We also have an issue, though, of the fact that we have high debt levels 
globally. We have rising debt within the US. If we have this expansionary fiscal policy, regardless of candidate, we're likely to have higher debt levels still. We're already paying, the US is already paying quite high levels of debt interest, and that does worry markets a little bit. And um, so looking at these factors, or considering those particular factors, you know, where does that leave us in potentially in the medium term, as opposed to that immediate short term or even longer term market outcome? So I'm talking about, you know, into the latter part of next year and into 2026. Because obviously, whoever gets in won't be um, officially sworn in until Q1 next year. So let me let me again. I, I like three. So let me let me try to make three points. I mean, the, the first is, uh, if we think about the U.S. economy today, then as you said, the broad thrust of it is positive, or at least I'm on the optimistic side of of, of the debate. And I really boil it down structurally to the very strong resilience of private sector balance sheets in the U.S., both household and corporate. But let me put the emphasis on the corporate side, uh, on the household side, where uh, we've seen, in particular, household net worth. Uh, rise tremendously uh, over the last really decade and a half, but it continues to add um, roughly a third of GDP almost every every year. The reason why I highlight that is because it's also a good differential. That's what distinguishes the US from a lot of the other uh, uh, economies. So the US outlook is very positive, irrespective of the election outcome. But at the same time, if you think about that medium term horizon, clearly we are in the, in, in the latter innings of this uh, cycle. So into next year, the growth outlook looks great. Anything beyond that, you have to factor in, uh, you know, medium-term downturn risks, uh, not just in the economy but in uh, financial markets, including that eventual reversal uh, in in the equity market as well. The second point is, you know, where where does the election uh, matter? And and Louison already uh, alluded to it. I mean, there are three areas where I think we can see pretty clear differences in the election outcome, even if it's just about the presidency, and that's around tariffs and border policies, including. Uh, immigration, it's in deregulation, and it's in aspects of foreign policy, where I guess the Ukraine-Russia uh, war is the most the most important. And if these things matter, they matter economically, but if we think of it, uh, they matter clearly for the sectors, uh, which will perform relatively differently under those outcomes, uh, meaningfully. But at the macro level, to some degree, they're, they're also offsetting. Uh, so if we think about deregulation as having a positive impact on growth, uh, reduced immigration, and some modest amount of uh, deportations will have a negative impact on growth. And there are similar considerations you can make uh, about tariffs even, where they will probably bring in investment into the US and at the same time, they themselves will have some negative uh, growth uh, impacts too. So the medium term macro picture, uh, I think is, is, is somewhat muddy between uh, those clear differentiating factors across the election outcomes. And again, leaving it aside the general point that of course, a lot depends on whether we will have unified government, which is much more likely under a Trump presidency than under a, a, a Harris win. But my third point is what so far been missing in, in this debate by me, even though Louis saw mentioned it already, is fiscal policy, where I think the immediate market response is clearly or is, is likely going to align, in particular, a Republican sweep with more expansive fiscal policy. There are risks for markets uh, attached to it. But if we really think through what will happen over the next couple of years, I think fiscal policy outcomes in the U.S. are going to be much more constrained and maybe in the end much less different between the, the, uh, the various outcomes in the election than you may think uh, at first glance. And that's partly, quote unquote, for good reasons. Again, the U.S. economy is doing well. So even if Trump uh, is winning a unified government, there's a chance that uh, his advisors will make clear to him that the last thing US, the U.S. will need if it continues to do well is even more fiscal stimulus. So even if he had the power not sure how much you would do. Similarly, if we get what is seen to be maybe as more of a, a, a consolidating public finances outcome, a Harris victory with divided government, I don't really see who is going to really force, uh, other than maybe inflation or the bond vigilances, but in the political spectrum, I'm not really sure who's going to really force uh, the, the next administration to proactively tighten fiscal policy. And if the last decade or so have been any guide in terms of US policy, it is that even when there are big divisions of opinion, they tend to get resolved by giving each party kind of what it wants. And that's so far never really been uh, a fiscally consolidating uh, outcome. So so just overall, I would say the medium term implications uh, macro wise are not that obvious to me and not that obvious to position for them. For now, I would 
uh, outside of the immediate election window, I vote with continued US resilience and, and, and good performance. Do you feel the same, Vincent? Louis Vincent? I do. Actually, I, I, I don't find much to, I'm sorry, I, you know, you, you wish you'd have uh, uh, people who'd, uh, who'd fight uh, to, with, with bare knuckles and, and disagree on everything. But no, no, I, I don't disagree with, uh, in much with uh, what Ibrahim said. Uh, what I would say is, look, uh, if you look at this U.S. election, uh, you can make many kinds of scenarios, you know, depending who wins the uh, presidency, who wins the House. Uh, you can make different scenarios um, on how the Fed uh, reacts uh, reacts to, uh, to the various outcomes. So let's look at the potential scary scenarios, the one that investors should worry about. Um, so I think that, you know, the, the first potential scary scenario, uh, the one that today seems to grab most people's attention, is you get a red sweep and, um, and that... Trump sees this as a sort of carte blanche to go full protectionist um, and that you go down the path of massive protectionism, big trade barriers, uh, send a lot of illegal immigrants home. Um, and it seems to me, at least from Beijing, where I'm having meetings right now, this is the scenario that uh, most people, uh, at least outside of the US, are possibly the most worried about. And funnily enough, I'm not that worried about it because um, I think that when it comes to, to Trump uh, and his protectionism, uh, the bark tends to be a whole lot worse than his bite. Um, I think we saw that in 2016. He was elected, if you remember, and the Mexican peso got crushed. The Mexican bond market got crushed. The Mexican equity market got crushed because uh, during the campaign, there weren't enough bad words in the dictionary for him to describe uh, Mexicans. Uh, I'm not going to repeat the insults uh, he, he had on Mexicans at the time. Um, and then what happened? He got elected. He sat down with the Mexican president. Uh, very, very quickly, he renegotiated the NAFTA, rebranded it to USMCA, and we were off to the races. And in the following five years, uh, the Mexican peso was the world's best performing currency. The Mexican bond market was the best performing bond market and Mexican stocks did fine. Um, and so, you know, today I think there's a lot of fear of the protectionist turn. Uh, and to me, these fears are, are overblown for, for a number of reasons, but I don't want to belabor the point. Um, I think there's a, a second, uh, perhaps somewhat more worrying scenario, you could say, is you, you get the GOP sweep. Uh, and you get the very aggressive fiscal plans, the tax cuts, the extra spending, et cetera. And, and the Fed turns around and says, not on my watch. Um, and that you get into a situation perhaps not that dissimilar to what you had in Germany uh, after reunification, when Helmut Kohl uh, basically said, we're reunifying, I'm going to spend a lot of money, I'm going to rebuild East Germany. And the Bundesbank said, well, uh, we're not paying for this. Um, and hiked interest rates in the face of uh, Kohl's spending plans, um, which created this sort of vacuum as you had very uh, lax fiscal policy and very tight monetary policy. Uh, it created this vacuum where basically Germany sucked in all of Europe's capital. Deutsche Mark went up. Eventually, uh, you know, we all know that's how Soros made his uh, billion uh, betting against the pound when the pound was forced out of the ERM. Uh, Italy was forced out of the URM, Sweden went bust, um, and because basically nobody could uh, keep up with Germany's very high real rates. Um, now, again, I'm not saying this is going to happen. Uh, I think there's you know reasons to think things are quite different this time, but this is uh, a scenario where per that perhaps we have to be attuned to. The, the possibility that in the U.S. you end up with much easier fiscal policy but perhaps tied to monetary policy that people uh, are expecting uh, and that this creates some real discrepancies in, in markets. Uh, and then I would say that the third potential scenario that, uh, that we have to worry about, um, which perhaps might be more likely than is currently priced in by markets, is the possibility that uh, uh, Kamala Harris wins the White House and the Republicans keep the House. Um, and the reason this matters is that we know that when they control the House and there's a, a Democrat in the White House, uh, the Republicans suddenly remember that they're supposed to be the party uh, 
of fiscal rectitude. Um, and it is at these times that they decide to slash government spending uh, and tackle budget deficits. Um, and so today, I think, you know, the, the markets are obviously priced for a continuation of economic expansion. They're priced for a continuation of very wide budget deficits. Uh, but if, to, you know, if the, the House says, look, party's over, we're now, um, you know, we're not going to cut the funding for the federal government, um, then you, you could easily put, push the system into a recession. Um, and a recession uh, that gets pretty big with, a, you know, then a stronger dollar and, um, uh, and uh, much lower bond yields. So I'm not saying, to be very clear, that any one of these three outcomes is going to happen. Uh, I actually don't believe one of these three outcomes is going to happen. Uh, nonetheless, you know, you, you have to come in open-minded uh, and I would say that if on the night you find out that Harris won the, the White House and, uh, and the Republicans kept the House, I think you want to uh, de-risk your portfolios quite meaningfully. Very interesting points on that. And just kind of coming back to the point that you made about what, if the Republicans controlled Congress, what would actually happen if we had a Harris win? And again, because these polls are too close to call and we also, we can get into discussions about who will actually concede um, and whether or not these votes will be contested in swing states and the implications of that on markets. Um, but if we do have that happening, we do have that fiscal cliff coming in January with the new budget. And even though the Republicans, as you say, might want to say, okay, we're the party of fiscal Austerity, not quite austerity, but you know, fiscal, uh, being fiscally tighter than the Democrats, they may be looking at some of those things in that potential budget, such as some of the aspects of you know the Inflation Reduction Act that Harris would likely continue want to continue that was brought in a couple of years ago, because many of the beneficiaries of that Inflation Reduction Act are actually businesses in the South of the U.S. and these are in Republican-controlled states. So would we actually see as much of a pushback as a result? Because in many of the states that are Republican leaning, they've been benefiting quite substantially from the fiscal um, policies of the current administration. So on this, I think um, if you look at state by state, uh, you may be able to, to indeed swing the, uh, the odd senator, uh, but I'm not even convinced. Um, I think when you look at district by district, what you find is that partly through gerrymandering and the re, the re, uh, the redrawing of various districts, um, what you find is that on both the Democratic side and the Republican side, um, you've you've made districts that are now much more partisan than they've ever been historically, uh, mm -hmm. and that's why you know you get this sort of ninety percent. Um, um, uh, incumbency, incumbency rates where incumbents keep getting reelected, etc. The map has been re re redrawn to such extents that, and you know, when you look at how districts are drawn, sometimes it looks like you know uh, uh, modern art uh, figures um, uh, cutting across the map of the United States. So I don't know. Uh, you know, you you'd like you you would think that. A lot of these guys would be bought off by projects in their districts. Uh, I'm not convinced. Um, I think if if Harris wins, the Republican Party is going to be uh, crushed. It's going to be very disappointed. Uh, it's going to probably feel that it was cheated because you know right now they're all feeling we've got the momentum, we've got the uh, we've uh, the you know betting markets are telling us we're winning. The polls in the swing states are telling us we're winning. So if we ended up losing, surely the Democrats must have uh, cheated. Um, that I think the the idea of if we come together and uh, you know all all start working together um, for uh, for a greater good. I'm uh, I'm very doubtful. I think I think um, th I agree with you. The likelihood of that um, we'll probably see if if. Harris were to get into office, and as and if we do have, as you 
both have alluded to, the uh, very strong potential for a Republican-controlled Congress, we'd most likely see a lot more executive orders coming through from the Harris administration, or potential Harris administration. And of course, that would cause a lot of um, political conflagration within, within the U.S. itself. Uh, difficulty within the U.S. itself. I just want to get quickly back to that point that I just raised earlier in terms of that the margin of the win. So even if Trump wins everything, which predictive markets seem to indicate and both, both of you seem to support, what about that margin of the win? What does that actually represent to markets in terms of stability? Um, and again, we're getting back to the issue of contested votes. This could be an election that is quite drawn out. Um, we still have a you know, number of lawsuits, over 100, I think, going on related to the vote. Um, and there could be a time frame which we gen have a general lack of clarity, clarity around who actually wins. Is, do you think that that's something markets should be worried about, both within the US and external to the US? Or is it of no concern, really? So, so my, my take would be, uh, again, three, probably three, three comments here. The first one is, uh, I think the polls ex ante being closed is not the same as, as ex post. Uh, and that's because a lot of the polling errors tend to be correlated. And we saw this in the last two uh, presidential elections. Uh, and therefore, uh, again, the base case is, and it's really quite plausible, that not only will the outcome be relatively clear, but Maybe we won't even have to wait all that long. Uh, and the last election, certainly for the presidency, was again fairly illustrative in that regard. Uh, we had, you know, lots of lots of movements, lots of lawsuits, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we really knew the outcome. Markets had priced the outcome, and we're off to the races uh, by by uh, the morning uh, of the day after. And that was despite the fact that uh, many aspects were still still to be resolved. So I will certainly keep that in mind that uh, we could end up having a relatively clear outcome, in which case, uh, of course, markets can, can move on quickly. Secondly, there are, uh, there are a number of scenarios under which uh, the outcome could be uh, close enough that there'll be some uncertainty. And I, I highlight two that are, I would say, relatively benign. Uh, I think there is uh, an outcome where you simply you know, have, to, have to wait a little bit, but it becomes, becomes clear that uh, President, uh, the, the, the president will be uh, Trump, and, and that is, uh, I think, again, not so different from what we had last time around. Uh, and it certainly will give you some jitters on the night, uh, as people have to certainly factor in a greater likelihood that maybe he will not win. But if that result comes through relatively clearly, uh, it, it will be a, 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 a dip to buy, if you like. And uh, somewhat, somewhat similarly, uh, I think the outcome where uh, you have clear clarity on the presidency, but it's really the House that is unclear, which is much more plausible. Uh, so uh, the House in particular is meant to be uh, pretty close, and there's much more room for recounts and such like to potentially end up making the difference there. Uh, no matter who wins the presidency in that regard, that might, after that initial draw, not be that worrying in the, in, in the end. The outcome of uh, the House by itself will not uh, worry markets uh, all that much. Again, conditional on who won the presidency. Again, it will be a disappointment if Harris wins the presidency for markets in certain aspects of markets. But I don't think that will get made much worse by having to wait uh, for the outcome for the House. Similarly, if Trump wins the presidency, we don't quite know what happens in the House. I, I think there will be momentary uh, reflection, but this is not going to be a big disturbance to markets. And then the, it's really the, the last case, and it's that's to the point that Louis Vuitton raised, that would be a big problem, which is that President Trump uh, or tr Trump loses the presidency by the tiniest of margins. Uh, maybe it will take a long time, or maybe even early on we find out, but it is the tiniest of margins, and that that will invite a lot of questioning about the election outcome. And it's not necessarily so much about the lawsuits, uh, even though they clearly won't help. But it is really the potentially contested nature of those elections, the potential for, for, for some type of uh, unrest that it could galvanize. And I do think that that would be a serious risk uh, to consider for markets. So in that scenario, and it's very hard to, to put odds on it. It's clearly not the base case, I think, but it's, 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 it's hard to uh, dismiss that risk entirely. Uh, 
And I think that could get you quite a meaningful, uh, difficult period for markets. So not only does the disappointment come with the election outcome, but that the contested nature of it, away from the legalities and some of the procedural issues, which are important but not decisive, I think, uh, at present, that's really one that, uh, as the title goes, uh, investors may have to be afraid of. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, I, I agree completely. I'll just add one, one quick thing. You know, after the past, you know, we know the U.S. is a very divided nation. We know it's a 50-50 nation. Um, and after the, the past contested, uh, you know, elections, um, I think if you get a very decisive outcome one way or the other, uh, the markets will act with relief. It'll be if, if you get a very clear winner where, you know, the other side can't say that there's been fraud or there's been Russian interference uh, or, or whatever else. If, if, if you get a decisive win, uh, I think it's, it's great news, uh, regardless of who wins. Uh, a decisive win would be tremendous. Okay, so we'll be keeping a, a very close look at, particularly within the swing states and in the jury. And as you've mentioned, many of the districts themselves have been gerrymandered over the past you know, decade or so. Uh, or longer. And, um, and, 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 and Renee, just to, just to uh, as a quick comment, because we, 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 we happen to agree a lot on the call with Rizzo and I, and, uh, I'm, I'm really privileged to have him on, on, on the panel with us today. My, my slide, and it's not quite a disagreement, but I think the nuance this time around is because I, I mentioned already, I, I strongly believe in the importance of risk premium for big events. And they've historically <laughs> been, you know, you, you sell the uncertainty and you buy the outcome. This time around, what I mentioned earlier, what is really unusual is the uncertainty is in the bond market and not in the equity market. And that matters both ways. It matters that you could end up uh, seeing, you know, what right now is against the grain of sentiment and, and market pricing, which is you may actually want to buy uh, bonds or you at least want to you want to be more ready to, to uh, harvest some premium uh, that ensures other people against higher yields. Uh, and, and, and that is because either you can get the unexpected outcome, the more fiscally responsible outcome, loosely associated with a, with a Harris victory, uh, but it could also simply be that so much has been priced in now in terms of higher yields and expectations that it's very hard for markets to climb that hurdle. And the reason why I make this comment is there is, a, uh, there is a, uh, a related point on the equity side, which is we are pricing much less in terms of equity downside risks into this election. And my outlook for the next six months, even through the end of the year in general, is really quite positive uh, for, uh, for equity markets. But we have taken out much less insurance against downside risks for this election than we did previously. So I think that there are two scenarios where you have a clear election outcome and it could still not turn out too well for, for, for equity markets. And I think that's, it is a, a Harris victory where simply I think There'll be some some uh, a number of bets uh, who that, that that need to be recalibrated at a minimum, and maybe that'll last a little bit longer than again pricing today would would already reflect. And the other, Lou, you saw already mentioned it is you get the over exuberant Republican victory. You get the bond vigilantes to be to be uh, awoken. And the reason why that's interesting is, is, again, simply because of the setup in markets. We are at U.S. real yields at 2%. We're at levels of the VIX that are, you know, maybe not high relative to where they were in the 2020 election, but they're at levels which historically are relatively close where they could start to be somewhat, somewhat disruptive. If you don't get the vol crash post-election, that's the somewhat more fragile uh, outlook for, for equity markets. So I see it a little similar to what Louis Hall said about, about risks. It's not really my, my, my best case outcome, but it is something which is quite different this time around from the others. It's a very good point. Um, okay, I want to get into one point to the fact that the wider implications of this election and why these elections may actually be scarier, scarier outside of the US. We know that European companies are already feeling the impact in terms of all the talk around tariffs. Uh, China, of course, um, which, as Louis Van Sant has pointed out uh, previously, is not as dependent on the U.S. for its revenues in terms of its exports, but it will also be impacted. And of course, there's the effect that will have on emerging markets, emerging market currencies, emerging market growth. So my question to both of you is, 
who should be the most afraid and why or why not i'll so, take the why not actually okay uh, i'll take i'll take the why not i think that uh, you, look the trump um uh, obviously you know a big part of the of the rhetoric is is the bashing of foreigners um and in fairness uh, to trump it's a fairly uh, uh he's, he's very um equal in his bashing uh he'll you know he'll bash europeans he'll bash mexicans he'll bash chinese he'll bash japanese um it's uh he's he's very non-discriminate in in that in that regards he hates um, all equally yeah yeah no if you're a foreigner you're wrong um so uh now having said that again if we go back to 2016 um you know he spent the whole campaign bashing mexico and then we negotiated a deal that wasn't that bad <laughs> Um, what he did do in 20, uh, in his first term is that he single-handedly changed the narrative in Washington, D.C. around China. You know, when, when he came in, uh, everybody in Washington, D.C. believed in engaging China, in uh, um, doing more work with China. And by the time he left, China had become this, this big, bad enemy. Um, and that, to me, is really... Uh, the big question is where does the China U S China relationship go, uh, under a Trump presidency? Now, I think the consensus uh, out there is that it can only go from bad to worse. Um, that, you know, the U S China relationship is already at rock bottom and that, uh, once he arrives, Trump will take a, sh a big shovel and, uh, and dig an even bigger hole. Um, I see it differently. I see it differently because first, I believe that Trump is first and foremost transactional. Um, his animosity towards China is not ideologically driven. It's very economically driven. Um, you see this in his campaign speeches. He keeps saying that he wants BYD to open a factory in Michigan and the autos to open a factory in Tennessee and so on. Um, things that uh, you know Biden never said or would have never agreed to in the first place. Um, so... You know, I, it seems to me that the market today is priced for Trump uh, A coming in and being a bad news for China. You saw this in the past three weeks. As Trump's polls have come back up, the Chinese stock market have rolled over and, uh, and fallen hard. Um, and it could very well be that Trump gets elected and China gets a bit of a kicking. Uh, but imagine if on the other side, you get some kind of news of a grand bargain where China agrees to open factories in the United States, perhaps agrees to revalue the renminbi, agrees to buy more U.S. treasuries, agrees to buy more Boeing planes or more tons of American soybeans. Uh, and against that, uh, China uh, is allowed to once again buy high-end semiconductors and semiconductor equipment manufacturers. Um, perhaps China, uh, you know, you see some uh, settlement over the tariffs. Um, there's a lot of things that actually the U.S. and China could negotiate over and find a compromise and find a deal. Uh, and let's not forget that, you know, Trump does see himself as a deal maker and uh, actually is out on, on the campaign trail saying that what he really enjoys about the presidency is cutting deals. Um, he, he said it again uh, just a couple of days ago at, uh, at one of his big rallies. Um, and so if the market starts sensing that you could actually, instead of having a big confrontation between the U.S. and China, you have some kind of grand bargain that is struck, then I think you come into 2025 with, on the one hand, China stimulating, and on the other, some kind of grand bargain. And it could be a, a big re-rating of a number of assets uh, under such circumstances. So... Uh, long story short, I think people are very afraid of, of Trump the protectionist. Uh, I'm actually hopeful on Trump the deal maker. It's a very interesting angle. Ibrahim? I, I find um, Louis Vuitton's argument very compelling. Uh, I, I, I also, I, on, the, on the China side, I mostly defer to him, but I would also say there's really very little upside. China under under a Biden administration, and if anything, you will face more uncertainty. And we know that markets and investors dislike uncertainty. But um, let me let me offer one each, and who should be maybe afraid, and and, and who maybe less than the markets are are, mm -hmm. are currently pricing. Uh, I would say in a similar category uh, as uh, as the 
the Chinese maybe degree of resilience is Mexico. And that's not so much because nothing can happen. We clearly will see some degree of pressure on maybe trying to renegotiate aspects. I would say that that, that is a constraint limit because it's U.S. corporates that have really been an interested party in not rocking the boat too much. But what I'm really trying to get at here is that this is an extremely well-flagged risk for markets. Uh, so, uh, for example, dollar uh, Mexican exchange rate has been uh, has been really strong, really strong of late. What is what is priced in terms of the volatility around the event is very high. There are obviously a couple of macro factors, both on the U.S. and on the Mexican side, that have supported that trend uh, going into it. But this is just to say that at this very moment, the uh, risks the, the, the risks for the U.S. Mexican trade relationship are really well priced. And it is one of the areas of uh, the U.S. election outcome, which are relatively more priced, and it's more priced, uh, relatively speaking, than perhaps issues even on the China-sensitive uh, asset side. So I think uh, that's not necessarily uh, an argument for buying the Mexican peso today or even on the eve of the election night. But basically, but, but for example, in 2016, we saw the low in the Mexican peso uh, shortly after the uh, election. So again, a big risk premium price usually is a good time to buy, and that might apply for the Mexican peso. But uh, there are there are areas, and let's call it one, one two, two, uh, that are clearly going to be at risk in, in a Trump presidency, uh, and that is Europe, uh, the European Union uh, in, 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 in particular. It is going to be in, in Trump's side because he uh, has historically been guided by a relatively simple arithmetic. He looks at uh, areas of the world which, which tend to have uh, some combination of a a bilateral trade surplus with the U.S., maybe a, an overall currency, a current account surplus, uh, and maybe some measure of higher uh, tariffs than the U.S. does. The idea of reciprocity was very prominent, continues to be very prominent, and the EU scores very highly in that regard. Uh, I think he perceives a power imbalance, which uh, we know affects uh, Trump's behavior as well, and it, it, ideologically, he isn't all that favorable towards the EU as well. So I think uh, European uh, economies are going to be challenged, uh, and that is also in part uh, in, in part because uh, the broader dynamic supports what I would call supply chain and end market diversification for European companies. So I think Europe is a little more in the crosshairs in, in the outcome of the Trump victory. And if you you know interpret the idea of Europe a little bit more widely, uh, then clearly the election outcome is going to have a, a, an impact on. Uh, U.S. postures and attitudes towards the war in uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, so I, I do I, I would expect less support uh, by the U.S. Uh, for Ukraine in terms of military aid and, and, and more generally in terms of continuing the war. So that could be quite a quite a big outcome, a big impact of the election. Now, to some degree, that may end up being a slight positive over time for uh, the European economy. So there are some silver linings uh, for Europe generally going to be under pressure. Maybe it will help resolve uh, the, the, the war on its borders. And more broadly, European companies are themselves a little bit more diversified than European economies are. Uh, so it's not all negative news under Trump victory, even for Europe. Okay, given all that, um, that actually gives me a good head <laughs> move into the question on the impact on alliances and trade. As we lo are looking at elections in parts of Europe next year, uh, potentially, if things do calm down in the Middle East, we'll be looking at elections in Israel um, if the state situation there stabilizes. Um, you know, and this will have a, a longer term effect um, if Trump gets into office on all the alliances that we see will also have an effect on oil, global oil prices, potentially, um, and again, global growth. So um, what do we think that overall, you know, the election, whoever wins, how that much that will really influence those alliances, that it will influence changes in global trade? Um, will it, you know, reinforce uh, friend shoring or near shoring or onshoring or discourage it? Um, any points of view on that? Yeah, look, I, I think it's pretty clear that uh, that Trump isn't a very, very big fan of alliances. That he's very keen on the U.S. having a lot of foreign commitments, um, and that he's actually very keen for U.S. allies to to step up and you know take care of their own problems. 
Um, so yeah, yeah, it's hard to imagine that after four years of uh, Trump presidency, any of the major alliances come out much strengthened. Uh, and it doesn't take much imagination to uh, to see them uh, weakened weakened going forward. Um, I think you know Trump is uh, he's he's not one for multilateralism. We know uh, he's all about one-on-one -on -one relationships. Uh, now, uh, I think he obviously feels very strongly about the the U.S. Israel uh, relationship. He feels very strongly about the U.S. Saudi uh, relationship. Uh, he doesn't really feel that strongly about any of the U.S. Uh, European relationships. Um, so, you know, where, where does all that leave us? Uh, you know, I think he'll come in, he'll try to sell a lot of weapons to Saudi. Um, he'll, uh, he'll continue pushing the Europeans to, to step up their defense spending, um, which, you know, comes at a pretty inopportune times for, for, for European countries uh, that are a number of whom are either dealing with recessions like, like Germany uh, or dealing with uh, already big fiscal crises like France. Um, so the, you know, the, the cash to, uh, to massively increase defense spending, whether you look at the UK, whether you look at France, uh, whether you look at uh, Germany might, might, might really not be there. Um, uh, but yet, uh, and to Ibrahim's point, uh, you know, European countries may, may well have to do that anyway. Uh, you know, we're, we're, it feels like we're coming to an end uh, to the Ukraine war, an end that, uh, uh, you know, is, is probably going to be some kind, well, it's going to be a defeat for Ukraine and thus a defeat for Europe. Um, and out of that defeat, we should increase our defense spending, uh, again, it, uh, with budgets that, that can't really afford to. Um, so I would say, you know, none of that is very bullish for, for the euro currency itself. Mm. None of that is very bullish for the for the European area. The, the reality is, you know, we've we've piggybacked. Uh, we I say we because I'm French. Uh, we've piggybacked. We've piggybacked on uh, on U.S. military spending and U.S. protection for years. Uh, and Trump is very very keen on highlighting that uh, that that free riding is is probably coming to an end. Yeah, it's a very good point on that. Um, and thank you for mentioning that in terms of euro and euro depreciation, because if we are looking at dollar strengthening, which would be the result of going back to the beginning of the conversation of these higher yields staying in play for an extended period of time, that is most likely what we continue to see happening, a weakening of the euro. Potentially, you know, what do, you, what do you, either of you give the odds of the euro as a result moving down almost towards parity with the dollar? I certainly think it's a it's it's a, it's a plausible scenario. I mean, I would I would I would throw in that I think the broader thrust globally in terms of alliances, etc., isn't I think decisively going to be changed by the outcome of this election. There are there are these impacts that we saw highlighted, but we are in a multipolar world, and the Biden administration really made very little difference uh, to that. And I think when people point to tariffs, I think it's a good illustration. You can roll back any of, of the tariffs, but if we even think about uh, those, those broad alliances, uh, yes, there was maybe a little bit more cooperation around uh, Ukraine, uh, but but generally speaking, it was really just mood music and the atmospheric change. Uh, I think the outcomes for international alliances uh, didn't change. And so the global South is kind of gone from a, from a U.S. perspective. It's not so obvious what the U.S. Uh, would offer it. And again, Europe will be more differentially affected by the outcome. And I, I would put that into the general uh, trajectory for dollar strength with a European specific uh, flavor. Now, you know, uh, we've, 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 we've traveled some way. It's not an unmitigated, uh, unmitigated bad. Uh, but could we, see, uh, could we see parity in, in euro dollar uh, in, a, in a continued period of uh, Trump victory led US outperformance into the first half of next year? I would say uh, I put a, 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 at least the one third odds on that, on that. So certainly very much in the, in the realm of, uh, of possibility. I, I, I agree with that. I would, I would add that, look, uh, almost regardless of what happens in the U.S., uh, things really aren't looking that great in Europe. Uh, again, you've got a genuine economic problems in Germany, uh, a genuine political crisis in France that's going to morph into a fiscal crisis. And the reason this matters is if you look at historically, uh, you know, you've always needed either Germany or France to lead in the European Union, partly because the whole 
apparatus of the European Union, when you go to Brussels, it's all manned by German or French civil servants. And the reality today is that you have a, a true vacuum uh, at the top of the, the German and French political uh, uh, structures. Neither Olaf Scholz nor Emmanuel Macron uh, carry any kind of respect, uh, carry any kind of weight, whether domestically or internationally. And so, you know, if, if you're, you know, for whatever reason does hit the skids, I think this lack of leadership, uh, you know, you, more often than not, the exchange rate is the first variable of adjustment. Um, so that's on a, on a political front. Then, then you look on, um, on an economic front. The real challenge, I think, that Europe is confronting today is that pretty much all the industries that Europe used to be very good in, the autos, the uh, industrial uh, robots, the specialty steels, the chemicals, any one of these sectors, uh, China has done such progress in over the past five years. You know, the, really the big, big, big macro story of the past five years is how China in industry vertical after industry vertical has leapfrogged the West. You know, China is now the biggest car export in the world. Who would have bet on that just three years ago? If you'd said that at a dinner party three years ago that you were thinking of buying a Chinese car, people would have laughed in your face. Um, and so, you know, I think this, this surge in Chinese industry uh, is a challenge for the whole world, but it's especially a challenge for Europe because that was one of our few comparative advantages. Uh, and again, I say we because I'm French. It was one of our few comparative advantages, uh, and that's being taken away. Um, uh, you know, you look at it, the only way Europe can compete today is if the exchange rate comes down. Okay. And let me, let me just quickly quickly throw in uh, the, the, the pendant to Louis Vuitton's French is, I, I'm German, I know my, my name and face don't necessarily give it away, but the accent does. And, and the one thing I would add, and it's more of a medium term orientation, is we also know that Europe and, and Germany specifically only change under pressure or, or uh, as, as you can put it, they do the right thing once all of the other opportunities are exhausted. And I think that I highlight that for two reasons. I mean, number, number one is we will have a new government in Germany over time, and that government will have somewhat more freedom to be active. Will it do the right things? It remains to be seen. Uh, but there's certainly a lot of reasons to think that we will see more of a response under the next government than we will from this one. And then maybe counterintuitively, uh, I think the Trump victory has uh, an opportunity to be a catalyst for more change. Uh, I think continuity for Europe in this current negative trajectory is actually bad. Uh, obviously, in the short term, it may make things slightly less painful. But again, sometimes Europe needs to be shocked into, do, into doing the right thing. Uh, so I have some sympathy with the argument that uh, the, the prospect and reality of more confrontational relations with the US, maybe being caught in the middle uh, of a US-China arrangement, may actually galvanize uh, some positive response from Europe, which is very much needed. Okay, that's uh, a very interesting perspective. And I just kind of want to touch on very quickly, I know we're running out of time. We talked a bit about the dollar. We've obviously just talked about the euro. We talked about equity markets. We talked a little bit about bond markets and where we think the pricing is or is correct or not correct on those. But I want to bring in this point about gold, which you touched upon earlier, uh, Louis Vincent, in terms of the gold prices. You know, gold's been up over 30% this year. It's not looking to come down anytime soon. Um, and also crypto has also been up when we look at, you know, it's been benefiting, um, uh, during this election. So, um, in terms of geopolitical risk versus the Trump or Harris policy impact, how do you think the direction of these will change or not? So, so that's look, that's, uh, of course, another important question. Uh, I'll, I'll start off by highlighting that you've never ever in history had a year where gold was up more than 25% and the S&P 500 was up more than 25%. And, you know, right now it, it looks like we're, we're heading that way. Uh, yes, we can throw crypto in there as well. Of course, the, 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 back, the backlog of, of crypto doesn't go very far. Um, but uh, you could look at this and say, okay, people are, you know, in our, it's looking like Turkey or Indonesia where people sort of lose faith in their domestic bond market and they lose faith in their currency and they just want to own real assets. Um, and so you buy equities because 
you know, in an inflationary era, equities will always keep some value, uh, and you want to own uh, and you want to own equities, uh, and you want to own, sorry, uh, precious metals. Um, what's been interesting to me on the precious metal front is that up until a few weeks ago, the gold was sort of going up in a vacuum all by itself. Uh, silver wasn't doing that great. Uh, platinum was going nowhere. Palladium was going nowhere. Um, and in recent weeks, mostly basically since China announced its stimulus, uh, you've started to see a big catch-up trade in, in all the other precious metals. Um, and, and look, uh, the simple reality is if we move to a world in which you have a uh, very easy fiscal policy, which is where we are today. Uh, a Fed that's cutting interest rates, again, which is where we are today. Where you have China easing fiscal policy and easing monetary policy. Where you have the ECB easing uh, monetary policy. Um, you know, you're in a world where you know, it, it's hard to imagine that, that gold uh, really collapses. Uh, you know, I, I think to, to get a big collapse in gold here, you either have to get a, a much, much more hawkish Fed than anybody anticipates. Uh, you have to either get a massive meltdown in emerging markets because gold is also an emerging market play. You know, people in India, when they get rich, they buy gold. People in China, when they get rich, they buy gold. Uh, but there's little sign of, uh, uh, of that happening today, of an emerging market meltdown. Quite the contrary. India is booming along, Indonesia is booming along, uh, uh, China is booming along. Uh, and then you get to your question of geopolitical risk. Uh, now, the reality is geopolitical risks have amplified a lot in recent years. Of course, Russia invading Ukraine, uh, all the tensions in the Middle East. And with that, of course, we've seen more gold purchases. Um, so, you know, could could the end of those uh, Middle East tensions or an end of Russia-Ukraine war lead to a collapse in gold uh i i don't buy it uh i don't buy it because even if those uh tensions come to an end um the real catalyst for the geopolitical move in gold was the western world's decision to nationalize uh russia's uh and to confiscate the holdings of russian oligarchs to confiscate the holdings of the russian central bank once we did that we basically told all rich people in the world we basically told all, uh, all the central banks in the world that keeping all of your money in banks and computers was actually not safe, that you needed to keep at least some in, uh, you know, in gold or in Bitcoin that you could uh, readily access. Uh, so you needed some assets outside of the system. Uh, once we weaponized the system against people we didn't like, whether Russian oligarchs or, the, or Russia itself, you... and we can say, okay, forget it. We didn't mean it. It's all good now. Uh, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, Humpty Dumpty's broken and all the king's men can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So um, I think that the bull market in gold has started. Uh, it, it's hard for me to see what, uh, what, what breaks it from here. And I, I, let me, let me tell you, I, 100% on the same page that Daryl Louis saw. I think, uh, as, as you put it well, you have some combination of diversification and insurance against debasement. So that's the fiscal monetary angle or expropriation. And they apply geopolitically, but they also apply domestically. And they are relevant for both gold and, and, and they are for, for Bitcoin. So structurally, very much on the same page. Two, how does this election factor into it? I would say only modest, so the bigger trend is much more important than the, the, the smaller uh, impact of the election outcome. But clearly, uh, Trump has found a, a new enthusiasm for, for, for crypto, so I think there is certainly a prospect that that could be re-energized, reinforced by his victory, and that could be under uh, presidency alone. It doesn't necessarily require Congress, even though it's not entirely irrelevant there. So I think for crypto, uh, it's more the Trump Victory for gold, it may be more because it's a bit more the debasement angle and maybe more uh, whether we will get unified government and the fiscal angle. Uh, but my third point, which is uh, this caution, uh, is gold is everybody's favorite now. And uh, one interesting change in dynamic that we have seen is that for the last 
year or so, for the most part, we had seen a lot of buying in, in Asia and in, in the East, and, and in particular from retail and, and from the private sector, very little buying in the West. And now we are also seeing a lot of inflows into ETFs uh, in, 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 in gold and, and, and related uh, securities. So it's not, I don't think this is a great moment to double down short term on the gold trade. If anything, may not may not be wrong to, uh, to, to go slightly the other way for a short term uh, trading opportunity, even if the long term trend is still further up, uh, as I agree. Okay. Interesting points on gold there. Right. Finally, um, as we're Towards the end of this, uh, I just kind of want to focus on what we think markets may be getting wrong in terms of the policy suggestions or the manifestos. Again, we've had certain things said, not always said very clearly by either side. Um, really, are the domestic changes that could happen under a Trump or Harris presidency not being considered enough? We could see a change in the Supreme Court political composition. Uh, we could see things, other things that will move the needles, potentially for investors in terms of how corporates are performing um, via, you know, if we see changes in the labor market under a Trump administration or even under Harris administration, where there's both sides are talking about being a little tougher on migration with Trump obviously being much, much tougher. Uh, so what do you think the markets are getting wrong potentially? in terms of these US domestic policy changes, or maybe they're not? Look, I think the, the biggest quandary in the market today is if we take a, a, a big step back, uh, you're in a situation right now where the US is 4% of the global population. Uh, it's roughly 24% of global GDP. Uh, it's roughly a third of global profits and roughly two thirds of the world MSCI market cap. Um, so you look at this, you know, and when I first got, came out to Asia, uh, you had Japan was 40% uh, of the world MSCI and it was 17% of global GDP. Um, and, you know, that, that discrepancy couldn't last. Um, today, the perception is, you know, of course, you got U.S. exceptionalism um, and that regardless of who gets elected, that U.S. exceptionalism uh, uh, stays. Now, staying with numbers, you know, the U.S. today accounts for 40% uh, of global budget deficits, and it accounts for 60% of uh, global current account deficits. Um, so to keep the show on the road, the U.S. is forced to, to attract uh, a lot of foreign capital. Um, now, I think the U.S. Is, um, is about to elect a president that a lot of foreigners feel deeply uncomfortable about, uh, for better or for worse. Um, that a lot of foreigners look at, uh, at President Trump um, and think, this guy hates me. Um, now, I think that's because they take him literally rather than seriously. Um, and I think that's perhaps where the market also gets things wrong, is you know they, they listen to President Trump and they take all the protectionist rhetoric uh, much more seriously than what he actually ends up delivering. And again, here, I'll, I'll just cite the Mexican example of 2017. Um, nonetheless, the fact remains that to keep the show on the road, the U.S. needs to attract a lot, a lot of foreign capital. Um, and whether the coming years, the U.S. still has that ability in the face of a China that, as I mentioned, has uh, leapfrogged the West in industry after industry and is rapidly gaining market share, uh, but also rapidly making friends uh, around the world. Uh, you know, 10 years ago, the general perception was that A, China didn't have a diplomatic service uh, and that B, China didn't have any friends. It just had a few make-believe friends like North Korea and Pakistan, people that it paid to be his, its friends. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I think that's a, a part of the a part that the world is really missing is uh, the progress that China has made diplomatically, the the entries it now has all across the world, whether in Africa and in, in Southeast Asia, the fact that you know China now exports more to Southeast Asian countries than it does to the United States. Um, I think that in all of our focus on deglobalization, 
uh, we've actually forgot that it, we're not going through deglobalization. Global trade is actually continuing to accelerate. It's just that we in the Western world are a smaller part of it. Um, and so, uh, you know, what, what are people missing? I think they're completely blinded to the unfolding rise of China uh, because they're blinded by uh, all those, the negative stories on uh, China's real estate bust, et cetera. And they're blinded to the extent to which the U.S. is dependent on foreign capital and how fragile that could actually turn out to be. Very interesting points. Abraham? So I, um, my, 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 my three points, once again, I mean, to your specific point about maybe some of the social impacts, they're clearly potentially very, very significant judicial appointments. Uh, there's obviously a, a, a women's health care topic in this election, which is, uh, which is major for, for many people in, in, in this country. And these don't tend to be all that relevant for financial markets. One aspect I would highlight where they eventually, I think, in a tail scenario, could become relevant for market is that you you, you end up seeing uh, a, a desire for very significant changes and that that would galvanize unrest on the street. Uh, I think it's unlikely. And, and, and maybe a, a comparison I would offer is what we saw in Israel uh, over, over a year ago, where you saw protests manifest themselves in response to some measure of desired uh, legislative and, 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 and uh, uh, constitutional changes. So very significant issues, generally not market relevant. Uh, other than in that tail scenario, what are markets missing? Otherwise, to my, to my mind, you, you mentioned a couple of things: uh, the differential impact on 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 China. Maybe that bonds could uh, do a little bit better around the election than some people uh, than some people think. Uh, but it, I also question what sometimes people say about the inflationary impact of potential Trump tariffs or Trump deportation, and that's partly because, uh, as Louis Vuitton said, the bark is often much worse than the bite. The idea that he will uh, impose universal, very high tariffs to me seems relatively implausible. Similarly, the degree to which we will see massive deportations to me seems unlikely. And even if some measure of these came about, how inflationary they directly would be, I would I would put a very big uh, uh, question mark on this. But I will end by by saying, I mean, for markets, the question very often is not just what happens, but what's next. And uh, if we had another hour, I would love to pick Rudy Sol's brain uh, about what's going on in, in Be Beijing right now, because I think it's very reasonable to think that what happens in China is going to be just as much or maybe more important for 2025 uh, than what happens in this U.S. election. And that's both because we have obviously significant developments in, in, in China, but also because there's sometimes a bit of an air pocket, uh, those kind of 12 months post a U.S. election where, you know, legislation is being ground out and those mills do grind uh, rather slowly. Uh, so I think what markets will start focusing on is first how to position into 2025, but what are really going to be the drivers? And, and China certainly is uh, among the most prominent ones there. On this, thank you. Uh, since, you know, you set it up, I have to say next week, not only do we have the U.S. election and the, followed by the Fed meeting, we also have China announcing um, uh, announcing what kind of fiscal stimulus it's going to be. We have the big uh, big fiscal meeting of, of the Chinese government. So everybody should rest well this weekend because it's going to be a busy week next week. Absolutely. Uh, very much agree with that um, because the market hasn't necessarily reacted positively to what China's said thus far, uh, in terms, of, particularly in terms of the mon loosening of monetary policy, a little bit, you've really not seen as much of a reaction as may have been hoped. So the fiscal points will be very, very closely watched. Okay, um, we do have a couple of questions from the audience, so I just want to go into those very quickly. Um, if the first one being, as the U.S. yield curve steepens, can the greenback, the dollar, hold its own given? still wide interest rate differentials? So, so I'll, I'll be quick on it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm still positive on the dollar into, into, into next year. The dollar, the US economic and, 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 and equity market or financial cycle are, are, are closely linked. Uh, again, that would in the short term depend a little bit on the election outcome. But the point applies that uh, a, a steeper US interest rate tends to be a bit of a challenge for the dollar. And that's both directly because it may simply reflect that additional risk premium you need for inflation, for other risks, but also because indirectly 
it, it means that hedging FX risks, even if you have asset disclosures in the US, becomes somewhat more attractive. Uh, so the steepening yield curve can be, can be a bit of a headwind uh, for the dollar, but I would still place that within a broadly positive US outperformance trend. Uh, so I think at the end, it's not the death toll uh, for a dollar performance. Okay. Um, right. Second question that we have on uh, coming through, if any, either of you can feel free to comment on this is, um, <laughs> out of the two candidates, which candidate will work to reduce tensions or trade war with China? Uh, we've discussed China so much about this. This election feels almost less about the US and more about China in many ways. Um, but do we get beyond the bluster, as you have said, we've said in that he will do a deal if Trump wins, if Harris wins, will she really also look to do a deal or will she be as tough or will she be constrained uh, in her actions one way or another by a Republican Congress, if we look at that? So uh, it's a super important question. Like I said, I'm sitting in Beijing today. Uh, it, it's a super important question for, for this part of the world. Um, I'm actually decently optimistic on this, that either candidate ends up being better uh, for the China relationship than what we've had today. Now, I, I think actually Trump ends up being the best of the two. Uh, like I said, he's very transactional. And I tend to believe that uh, Trump knows that he needs a deal with China if he's going to get strong growth and low inflation in the U.S. at the same time. Uh, I also think Trump knows he's here for only one term. He's here for a good time, not a long time. He wants to uh, he wants to maximize uh, the growth uh, as much as possible. So uh, so I think he would be better now. Uh, when it comes to Kamala Harris, uh, it's harder to know because we don't really know who's part of her team. Uh, she hasn't really talked about foreign policy. It doesn't really seem to be a concern of hers. And to be honest, I think if she comes in. Um, She's probably going to think, if I'm going to get reelected, it's because I will have solved the border. It's because I will have tackled health care issues, because I'll have tackled education issues, the cost of education, the cost of health care. Um, you know, and so I don't think she'll be that focused on, on foreign policy. Nothing in her career uh, leads you to believe that she'd be that interested in foreign policy, as opposed to Biden, for example, who was, you know, uh, head of the uh, Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate. Um, and actually, I think that's better, you know, because Biden brought with him a view of the world that was split between good democracies and bad non-democracies. If you remember when Blinken and Jake Sullivan sat down with Liu He and Wang Yi in, uh, in Anchorage in, uh, in May 21, you know, Blinken sat down and said, you know what, we don't like you guys. You guys are communists, you're authoritarians. We don't want anything to do with you guys. At which point the Chinese said, well, that was a short meeting. Um, and walked out. Um, and now here's what we do know. We know that uh, Kamala Harris and Blinken don't get along. Kamala Harris and Jake Sullivan don't get along. Uh, we also know that Biden was the only U.S. president since Carter to not visit China, uh, that uh, Jake Sullivan only went to China once, and that was two months ago. Um, so I think whoever comes next will be better, uh, to be honest. I think they'll bring forward a vision of the world that is hopefully less Manichaean, less split between good versus bad countries, uh, less white hat versus black hat uh, view of the world, uh, which I, I think would be massively productive. Okay, uh, good good response to that. I really, I really I, that was very interesting. I, I really don't have anything to add. I think benign neglect is the hope in, in, the, in, the, Harris, in the Harris victory, victory outcome. But uh, yeah, very interesting. So benign neglect, that, that's, a, that, that's going to be a new, a, a new one for, um, for, for, for a discussion. Okay, uh, very quickly, we have time, I think, for one last question. So I'm going to move quickly ahead. Um, just because what you're talking about, that bit of benign neglect, neglect forecast for the Israel-Iran tensions after the election, does, hum, does Harris or Trump make any difference in this sense, and we think again, going back to geopolitical alliances, does it matter? Well, I, I will I will say, uh, uh, having grown up in Germany to Iranian parents, my 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 main source of expertise is that I left the region when I was less than four months old. Uh, so I say I will say everything with a 
with a large dose of, of, of humility. And my, my principal point would simply be keep this risk on your radar, even this weekend, and certainly for the lame duck period. Uh, so there are many reasons to expect some degree of further escalation uh, and, and perhaps in, in unexpected ways uh, and, and some speculation that that could happen even before uh, actual election day. So the next couple of days are relevant in that regard as well. Uh, and then my second point would just be we, we kind of know how, how Trump likes to operate. He doesn't really care about general conventions. He doesn't care particularly about international law. But he's also not, he doesn't like to be taken advantage of. Uh, so as, as much as there is some perception of, of where uh, the relative preferences of the, of the different candidates are, I think what will in, end up being relatively beneficial is that I think it'll be like much more clear what the, what the uh, policy orientation will, uh, will be. And I think that's relevant for, for financial markets. I'm slightly hopeful that it may actually end up being helpful for generating outcomes because uh, at the end of the day, you know, uh, uh, an, an, an end with horror is better than horror without end. Uh, so I, I, I think, you know, in, in, that, in that calamitous present situation that the Middle, Middle, Middle East faces, that's again, that's more a hope that I would express and by no means a, a forecast. Absolutely. Okay, I think we are at the point where we just about we have run over time. We've not come and ch chatting. We can keep going on this for quite a long time. I think there's so much to cover. Uh, well, thank you both for participating within this. We did have one question we didn't quite get to. Uh, maybe I can stick in very very quickly. Hopefully, our audience will be patient with us. It's really the fact that the stock market seems happy no matter what at this point in time. You've talked about the risk premium not being in there necessarily. Right now, the stock market seems happy. We have a strong U.S. economy. Um, is that the, it, we've pretty much ascertained that that's pretty much the case. Is, is that agreed that right now, for the or at least for the immediate future, after the election, stock markets are still going to remain relatively happy? They're they're going to be focused on what's happening through in terms of corporate earnings. Yeah, and I think look, we have reflationary policies everywhere. You know. U.S. has super easy fiscal and easing monetary. China's got as easing fiscal and monetary right now. Europe is easing monetary policy. Everywhere you care to look, you've got stimulative policies. So, you know, why would you want to stick around in bonds? Um, yeah, it makes a lot more sense to be hanging out in equities against that policy backdrop. Yeah, and I, and I very, very much agree. Only caveat I offer is, as you said, everybody seems to be agreeing right now. And I think that's most relevant just for that immediate window around, uh, around the election. Uh, we, we talked about it. Equities could maybe face a little bit of a setback on, on a bit of indigestions in bond yields on the surprise uh, Kamala Harris victory or simply on profit taking. So there is some, some room for, for very short term volatility. Now may not be the time to chase. But overall, I'm very much in the camp that we'll see positive environment for risk assets into next year. Great. Well, thank you both very, very much for it's been a wonderful conversation. And we'll all be looking very closely, uh, staying up very late in my, <laughs> in my case in London, uh, to take a look at what's coming through with the US election. Who's won? By what margin? Um, if we know, how quickly we'll know. Um, and we will have to wait and see whether or not uh, markets, if we, have any surprises in store, but we all seem to think that they really won't at this point. Um, and with that, uh, thank you again, and thank you to the audience for tuning in to our US election special.